The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I am Andrea Rosman, your webinar host from Main Street ROI, and we are very excited to once again have another of our Master Your Marketing series where we bring together leaders in the digital marketing world to bring you great content focused on all the great ways you can grow your business. This series is sponsored by all of our partners, Active Demand, AdRoll, SpyFu, WooRank, AdThis, Optimizer, and iContact. Lots of great people involved. Uh, for today's webinar, we are super excited to once again welcome Fred Valais, co-founder and CEO of Optimizer. The presentation is going to be about 40 to 45 minutes so that we can leave plenty of time at the end for live Q&A. Um, feel free to type any of your questions that you have in the Q&A box along the way, and we will get through them at the end of the webinar. As always, today's webinar and all of our webinars, it, it's recorded, so we will send out the replay video along with a PDF of slides to everyone who has signed up. So if you get calls or pulled away for work, please don't worry, you're not going to miss a thing. With that, I will turn the webinar over to Fred so he can get started. Thanks, Andrea, and uh, thanks for having me back on this session. I think I've done it about four or five times now. so. Uh, Hopefully, I'll be able to share some, uh, some more great content like I've tried to do in the past. And the topic today is going to be the best automations to optimize your Google ads. Um, and so for those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, uh, who am I? So I was Google's AdWords evangelist back in the day. Uh, I joined Google in 2002 when AdWords was just beginning. And uh, I was hired specifically to translate AdWords into Dutch and to do Dutch customer support. Uh, so if you want to place my accent, I'm originally from Belgium. Um, and so I started doing that. And then I started doing a lot of education and training as an evangelist and, and really basically going out into the field and telling people, uh, small businesses, big businesses, how they could leverage this great PPC advertising platform to really grow their own business and their own companies. Uh, since then, I le I've left Google after about 10 years and I started my own company. It's called Optimizer. Um, I still blog for places like Search Engine Land. So if you want to see what I think about the PPC industry, the marketing industry, uh, that's a good place to stay up with everything I'm talking about. Um, and as you can guess, a lot of what I talk about is related to automation. And that's exactly the topic here today. So I know a lot of people signed up to be on this webinar. So thank you very much for attending. Uh, and I think the reason why you're attending is probably because you want to stop doing this shit. Um, and so, excuse my language, but this is an actual sticker and actual T-shirts that uh, people have been handing out at PPC conferences. So that's why I feel pretty comfortable showing this on the screen here uh, as, as part of a webinar. But basically, when you think about your PPC work days, all the work that you have to do to make your Google ads really work well, um, is that there's a lot of tedious tasks, repetitive tasks, uh, and ultimately these are things that machines are getting better at doing. Uh, so that, that's kind of one of the drivers of why people come to this webinar and want to do more automation. The other driver, honestly, is the fact that Google uh, and even Bing to some degree are really forcing us to deploy more automation. So when AdWords was built back in the day, Google Ads was built you know, in 2002 or 2001, you really had to do a lot of stuff manually. You had to choose keywords. You had to set CPC bids. Uh, you had to write your own ad texts. Over time, and especially today, you can automate bidding. You can automate the ad text generation. Uh, a lot of the keywords and targeting is automated. You, you give Google some base level information, but then they handle it uh, from that point forward, right? So uh, either you're here because you want to do more automation or you want to understand what is all this automation that Google is throwing at us and how do we as humans still fit into that picture? So uh, before I get into the solutions and the tools that you can use to automate, I think it's interesting to talk about what things should we even try to automate, right? There's so many tasks that we do on a day-to-day -day or on a monthly basis to keep our accounts healthy, to inform our customers about what's happening with the account management that we're doing. So let's just draw a quick little graph here. And we have two axes, right? So on the y-axis, you can see tasks that we do frequently at the top or infrequently at the bottom. 
And on the x-axis, uh, on the right side, you see things that are time consuming. And then on the left, we see things that are pretty quick. So what I do is I take my list of tasks that I do for PPC, and I just put them on this quadrant. So when it comes to updating budgets, that's relatively quick. I don't do it often, I do it about once a month. So that falls on that quadrant. Managing bids, pretty frequent task, but it doesn't take a lot of time. Reporting, I don't do it all that often, but it takes a lot of time. It can take four or five hours a month to put together a nice report. And then if it comes to ad testing, that's pretty ongoing. So that happens all the time. And it can be somewhat time consuming because you really have to think about what is the message that we put in the ad that's going to resonate with users. So uh, after I put all my tasks on this sort of a quadrant, now I know my number one task to go and automate is probably ad testing because I do it often and it takes a lot of time. And then I can look at the next two quadrants here. That's what I'll automate next. And if I have some time left, if I have some, some resources left, budget updates, that might be the final thing that I build an automation for. Okay, so that's what should be automated. But now let's ask the question of what can be automated, right? So you might think about something like ad text optimization, um, and then you might think it's actually really hard to automate. So the, the fundamental way to think about automation is if you can write down the steps, you can probably automate it. Now, many of you have heard about Upwork, Odesk, all of these places where you can go and put out a contract for a task to be done, usually by someone in a lower cost market, right? So by someone in the Philippines, someone based in India. And if you get that person to do it, you have to explain what it is that needs to be done. <clears throat> so you write down a sequence of steps, the logic that they go through. If you can do that, that's basically automation, right? So in the case of Upwork, you're automating by sending the work to someone else to do. But at the same time, you could say, uh, have a computer do that work because you can define exactly what needs to be done. So let me give you some examples here. So when it comes to bid management logic, uh, a very simple rule that you might want to run is if I'm below my CPA target and I have at least 100 clicks, then go ahead and raise my bid because I can afford to spend more. And by bidding higher, I might actually get more volume. I might get more conversions while still staying within my cost per acquisition target. Now, the other thing is budget rules. So, uh, and this is a very simple one, but if, I, if I've if i spent more than my allowed budget for the month, I want to pause everything. I want to pause all of my campaigns. <clears throat> These are highly structured. You can write down exactly what needs to be done. So you can either give it to a human or you can look at some of the tools I'll explain next, like AdWords scripts to fully aut automate this without getting any humans involved in the process. Okay, so... All right, so the, the next thing then to look at is how do we break certain tasks into its component parts? Um, so if you remember, ad testing for me is one of the most frequent tasks. It's also one of the more time consuming ones, uh, but it may seem hard to automate this based on the last slide. So, so if you ask, can I write down the exact process of how I do this and can I fully quantify it? Um, actually, the answer is sometimes no, right? It's, it, for me, writing an ad that puts together all the right components and really speaks to the potential customer, uh, that's not something that automation or that computers are gonna be really good at. But if I break the task of ad optimization into its components, I can find that there's actually many parts of that that can be automated, um, that are very, very structured. So for example, removing losing ad texts. Well, you can automate that because it's basically just a statistical significance calculation that says, inside of an ad group, which ones are my statistically significant losers, I'm going to pause those. And then I'm left with a couple of ads that have done pretty well. And between those ads that are doing well, I can identify numerically my best performing ad. Now, how you define that, that's completely up to you. Some people might say, I want to find the one with the best conversion rate or the lowest cost per acquisition or some combination of those things. But it's a numbers game, right? It's something you would typically do in a spreadsheet like Excel. So that you can automate. Um, finding your best call to action. This is actually a really fun thing to do through automation because you can start see, um, splitting up the ad text components into its parts. So rather than looking at the whole ad, now you're looking at strings of text. And for example, you could say, if I'm using the call to action, sign up today versus sign up now, uh, slight difference in wording, which one is the better performing one? So again, that's something you would typically do in a spreadsheet so you can automate that. Now, where it sort of falls apart is starting the new ad tests. <clears throat> Once I know my best performers historically, 
and my best components? How do I put those together into interesting new ads that I can start to experiment with? That's the part that I still have to do manually. Um, and so even though you can't fully automate ad testing, there's a significant portion of this that you could, right? And that's still where you would use tools, you would use automations to, to, to get more of that work done for you. So ideally, the vision for me would be, I want to come into the office in the morning, steps one, two, and three would already have been done for me by the machines, and now I can get straight into step number four rather than spending half of my day manually doing tasks one, two, and three. Okay, so that's how you can get uh, into automating virtually everything. <clears throat> now, uh, let's talk about tools. Uh, we've talked about what can be automated, what should be automated, how you break down your tasks. Now let's talk about how you actually implement some of these things. So one of the most basic automations that everyone has access to in Google Ads is bidding. There's smart bidding from Google. And so very simply, they would say, we will hit your cost per acquisition or return on ad spend targets by using predicted conversion rates and Google and its machine learning, its artificial intelligence does the math to figure out based on the, predict uh, the predicted conversion rates, what should be the cost per click bid to help you achieve your cost per acquisition goal, right? So that's an automation that anyone can use for free. Now let's get a bit more sophisticated. So you have automated rules. Automated rules are super quick and easy, uh, but they're kind of limited in terms of they can only do simple logic. So for example, um, and I did this through a script one time. So I spent a lot of time writing a script. And at the end of like half a day of writing code, I was like, oh, wait, Google actually has a free tool called Automated Rules where I could have done the same thing in two minutes. Um, so uh, and, and the case that I was building for was I wanted to turn on different ads on the weekend and the weekdays. So all you have to do is put a label on the ads for the weekdays versus the weekends. And then you have an automated rule that runs, say, for example, Saturday morning at one o'clock in the morning, looks for all the weekend ads, turns those on, turns the weekday ads off. Same thing, Monday morning, 1 a.m., you do the opposite. You turn off the weekend ads and uh, you turn on the weekday ads. So simple little automations like that, completely free to build through automated rules in AdWords. Now, this is my favorite. This is the one I talk about all the time. Google ad scripts, uh, nowadays even Bing ad scripts. So I don't know if everyone's heard, but Bing now also has scripting capabilities and they basically copied exactly what Google was doing. Uh, but th this is cool because now marketers can actually start building advanced automations. And this is really where you can start looking at the tasks that you spend the most time on, the ones that you do most commonly. Um, and you can automate these. And these automations can actually run once per hour as opposed to rules, which can only run once per day. Um, so a script would be really good to look at, have I exceeded my monthly spend? And if so, pause all of my campaigns. It would have been nice if I could build this through a rule, automated rule, but I can't because the automated rule can only run once a day. So it puts me in a position where I could potentially have 23 hours of additional spend before this, the, the rule actually notices that we've spent too much and we should pause everything. With the script, I can check things once per hour. Now, scripts are really easy to build, and I'll show you exactly how to do that. I'll give you a couple of uh, copy and pasteable chunks of code. <clears throat> but if you do get more advanced or you have a really big account, um, you know, maybe not so many people on this webinar today, but say that you have an account with a million keywords, that may not scale very well through a script unless you've done some tricks to really make that script uh, very efficient. That's where the API comes in. So just so you know, there is an API available. It's technically more work to set it up. There's more maintenance involved, but this is something that scales much be uh, better to bigger accounts. And it can also be automated as often as you need. So not just once per hour, but you could literally run this as many times as you need, so long as you have the server infrastructure to support it. So that's kind of your spectrum of tools that are available to do these automations. <clears throat> now let's talk about automated bidding a little bit more. Right, so because this is the most accessible, this is probably the thing that most people are going to be using. And by the way, so I run Optimizer. Um, we recently had a good number of our customers come to us and actually be relatively surprised that they were using automated bidding from Google and they had no clue they were even doing this. Um, so what sometimes happens is if uh, you set up a new campaign and Google asks you a few questions during the campaign setup process and they ask you, hey, well, what goals do you have? Are you trying to generate conversions or sales? And based on those answers, they automatically pick an automated bidding strategy. 
So, uh, and people don't correlate those two things necessarily. So they end up on some sort of automated bidding system without even knowing it. Now, the way that these automated bidding systems from Google work is they call them smart bidding. And they look at factors like uh, what is the time of day? What is the device the user is using? Um, what's the day of the week? What other searches has that person done? Based on all of those factors and a lot more factors, they make predictions about how good a potential click will be. And good, of course, correlates to your desired goal. So is that goal to sell things or is that goal to get leads? Uh, if it is to sell things, then Google will also look at the predicted value of the sale. Uh, is that customer going to spend $5 or is that customer likely to spend $500? Obviously, $500 being better than $5 in many cases. Uh, but by the way here too, Google does not look at margin data. So they just look at the value of the shopping basket. So if your $500 product actually doesn't make you a profit, whereas your $5 one does, then Google's going to have the wrong information. They might actually prioritize the wrong things. But that's fundamentally what smart bidding does. So now smart bidding actually falls into a couple of buckets um, or actually automated bidding, I should say, falls into two buckets. So on the right hand side of the slide, you see what Google calls, quote unquote, smart bidding. Uh, by the way, everything these days, everything at Google seems to be coming, quote unquote, smart. Um, and it's, they just mean these are the automated systems that are using the latest machine learning to achieve their goals. So things like target cost per acquisition, target return on ad spend, enhanced CPC, which uh, in increases and decreases the actual bid based on the predicted conversion rate. And then there's another one called maximize conversions. These are the smart bidding options from Google. Now, I like the smart bidding options. I think you can make them do even better things, and I'll tell you how. Uh, but smart bidding, those are good automated bidding methodologies. Now, on the left side of the slide, Google doesn't officially give these other ones a name, uh, but I call them vanity bidding, right? So stuff like get me as many clicks as possible, but without regard to how good these clicks are. Uh, target location on the search page. So I want to show at the top of the page or I want to show on page one. Uh, again, that's sort of disconnected from typical goals that you see in Google ads, which typically have to do with driving conversions or driving sales. This is more of a branding goal, right? I just want to show up on a certain uh, location on that page. Target at rank. This is an interesting one too. This says, uh, me as an advertiser, I want to outrank amazon.com or some other domain that I pick. Now, you get into interesting situations where multiple advertisers are trying to outrank each other. So they keep bidding up and up and up. And the only winner in that game, I think, is Google. Google makes more money by pitting the advertisers against each other and depleting their budgets until there's only one winner left. And then there's a brand new one that they just announced, I think it was uh, one or two weeks ago. It's target impression share. Uh, so, for example, targeting impression share for top of the page. This is also very much a branding goal. Google even says this, right? So this is vanity bidding. This is not connected to how many sales you have. This is about you being on the page. I like the stuff on the right because that's traditionally what we've done through Google Ads. Google Ads has been about getting people to sign up, become a lead, become a customer, not so much branding, right? So, but the branding options you have available too. Now, a couple of common problems, and I'll go into details on each of these, but you can't use smart bidding because you lack enough conversions. That may be a fairly common problem if you have a smaller account. Um, you might be setting bids based on incomplete conversion data. That's a bad thing to do. You might be using the wrong bid strategy. Google gives you eight options. Well, if you don't understand the nuances between the different options, you might actually pick one that's not ideal for you. Um, and then finally, relying on automations that don't necessarily know exactly what your business is all about. So let's jump into a bit more detail on these. So first of all, if you're automating bids, but you don't have enough data, uh, it's just not going to work. So first of all, if you don't have 15 conversions for a campaign within the past 30 days, then Google cannot turn on smart bidding. Now, even Google says, ideally, you should have at least 50 conversions. 15 is the minimum. 50 is the minimum to do a really good job. Right? So if you have a modest budget, it may be really difficult to reach those numbers. Um, and that means you either don't use the solution or the solution is not going to work as well as Google thinks it could because the data is simply too sparse. So we have a couple of solutions. The first solution is to think about micro and macro conversions. 
I'm sure many of you have heard about this before, but a macro conversion is really your big goal. So if you look at that graph right there, the biggest circle, that's the thing you care about the most. You want to get that sale. Now, there's other things people can do on your website, like signing up for a newsletter, downloading a white paper. Those are micro conversions. They're less important to you. But the reason that these are interesting is that despite you valuing the sale and the macro conversion the most, you typically have more data from micro conversions. So the, the less important stuff on your website. So what you can actually start doing is you can start making the micro conversions, the conversions that you use for bid optimization, because you know that certain percentage of people who sign up for the newsletter or who download the white paper will eventually lead to a sale. So rather than having your hands bound because you don't have enough data, you find the thing that correlates strongly to the sale eventually happening, and you make that the data point that Google is optimizing for, that these smart bidding strategies optimize for. So micro conversions can really help you deploy more of these bid automations. Now, the other thing uh, that we often look at is if you need to get more conversions, there's kind of two hierarchies that you can go up to get more data, right? So say that at the keyword level, you had one conversion, well, maybe the ad group that the keyword lives in had three conversions and the ad group that the uh, or the campaign that the ad group was in has 10 conversions. Now, most people structure things based on some similarities, right? They, they will put similar products, similar services inside the same campaigns. So it's usually OK to say, well, if this campaign has a conversion rate of X, uh, that probably kind of whittles down to all of the keywords within that campaign. So that's one way to get to more statistical significance. The other thing you can do is if you know that there's a certain seasonality, uh, you can look at a longer date range. So you can go from seven days back to 28 days back and even further back until you get enough data. What I like to do is I actually mix and match. So I might look at my keyword for seven days. Does that have at least um, 15 conversions? If not, then I still look at the keyword very specific, but I go to 28 days. If I can't do that, I don't want to go further back in time. So now I look at the ad group for seven days and I keep jumping back and forth between those levels of data. Now, the other thing, um, after you've done this, that I sometimes see people do incorrectly in bit management is they overbid, right? They, they start stacking bits. So if you have a rule, like if my average position is too low, then I'm gonna raise my bid. So say that you were looking at three weeks worth of data to figure out your average position. And then based on that, you say, I need to raise my bid. Now, next week you run the same automation Looking back at three weeks of data, well, guess what? There's only one week of data with the new bid and two weeks of data with the old bid. So your averages are not actually correct. So if I, again, make a decision to raise my bid by 10%, I might actually be over allocating because what I should have looked at in that case was just the last week of data uh, since I changed my bid. So just keep in mind, if you're doing something more manually using automated rules or using scripts, Make sure that the frequency of your automation is in sync with the look back window that you're using to make your decisions uh, and don't make that mistake. Now, the other problem that we see uh, related to bid management is conversion delays. A, a lot of people don't realize this, but somebody clicks on an ad on Google and then takes a number of days to make a decision about whether they're going to buy that thing or sign up for, uh, you know, become a lead. Uh, this is called conversion lag. Google actually reports this data through their reporting system and they also have it as a column in, in Google Ads. Uh, but you can see at a campaign level what is the typical number of days between the click to a conversion. And some accounts that we look at, these numbers are very, very significant. Some, some accounts we see more than 30% of conversions happening more than two weeks after the click came in. So if I'm making decisions based on last week's data, it's basically an incomplete picture. I'm going to make the wrong bidding decision um, or if I'm reporting to my client, my client's actually going to freak out because they're going to think re results have really dropped off when in fact, it's just a conversion delay. I shouldn't even be looking at that last week of data until all those conversions have come into the system, right? So there is a way using the conversion lag bucket for you to know exactly how many days should you be pushing back the numbers that you look at. Uh, now, as far as selecting a bid automation, uh, you, you can do some things wrong here too. So um, if you don't know exactly what the automation is doing, you could set yourself up for a little bit of a failure. So here's one of the most common ones that we see. Some people like to use the maximize clicks bid automation from Google. 
Okay, so how do you get the most possible clicks for a given budget? Well, simply by buying the cheapest possible clicks. That's how you get the most for a, a set budget. Okay, but why are certain clicks cheap? Okay, so if you look, um, you know, where those arrows go down, smart advertisers who are doing conversion tracking don't buy bad clicks. They don't buy bad clicks because they know they're not going to convert. Okay, so hence competition for these clicks is low. And as that competition is low, these clicks become cheap because they're bad clicks, but there's lots of them. So guess what? You are on maximized clicks, but you are competing against advertisers who are doing conversion tracking. They are intentionally not buying those clicks because they know they're bad clicks. So what you're basically saying to Google is, we'll take the bad clicks, spend all of our money on the clicks that nobody else wants to buy because those are the ones that are plentiful, right? So that's kind of how... Um, you can set yourself up for lots of clicks, which, which may look good to you, but at the end of the day, you really care about getting new customers, right? So you want to prioritize the good clicks. Now, the other thing that people sometimes do wrong when it comes to automated bid management is they say about maximize X, okay? So that could be maximize conversions, could be maximize conversion value. Um, and I've got a, lot, a few illustrations here to, to kind of show what this means, but uh, but, but here's the, the simple example, right? So say that you have a $2,000 budget. Um, Google has gotten you 100 conversions for the first $1,000 of spend. Uh, but all of a sudden, it's becoming really expensive to get additional conversions. So if you say just maximize my conversions, um, the first $1,000, you were basically getting leads at $10 per conversion. Now, Google says, well, we have $1,000 left in the budget, and we could probably get you one more conversion. So that conversion would be 100 times more expensive than the first conversions that you got. If you say, Google, it's okay, maximize conversions, that's my strategy, they will basically buy that click because one more conversion has, in fact, maximized your conversions. But if you look at the cost per acquisition, it's horrendous, right? You shouldn't have stopped advertising after 1,000 clicks. So kind of to illustrate this is you have to think about the concept, concept of incremental cost per unit. Um, you can actually calculate this out from the bid simulators and some of the data that Google gives you. But basically, if your goal is to maximize your profit, you should stop buying clicks when your incremental cost per click becomes greater uh, than the cost of that additional click. Um, let me put this more simply. Google has a strategy called target cost per acquisition. That one will respect um, get, getting you the good numbers. A very similar strategy is maximize conversions. To, to a lot of people, these sound almost exactly the same. Maximize conversions, that's the bad one. That's going to overspend on additional conversions. Target cost per acquisition, that's going to maximize your profit, right? So, um, so that's kind of how to think about those things. Now, the final problem here that we, we have with bidding is that, like I said, Google looks at signals to predict conversion rate predict the, the, the sales value that's going to come from the next click. But does Google look at the factors that actually matter to your business? So even if you're running on a target cost per acquisition and say you have a ski resort and your goal is to sell as many ski passes as possible, well, does Google actually look at how much snow fell over the last week and what the, the weather conditions are going to be for your ski resort? Well, chances are they're not. And, and, and even if they are, Google doesn't actually disclose the factors they look at. So a smart advertiser will take an automated bidding strategy from Google, like target cost per acquisition, and they will overlay their own data on that. So they will say, well, because we just had an amazing amount of snowfall, the powder is really good, we're going to have a sunny weekend, I'm actually willing to increase my target cost per acquisition because I know my conversion rate is going to be way better than it usually is because the conditions are so good. So you know, even when people talk about automated bid management, it's just Google doing the translation from cost per click to your target goal. But there's a lot of other stuff that's not being automated where you still have a role to play in terms of changing those targets. Um, and I've written a lot about this on Search Engine Land. So if any of this piques your interest and you want to get some more detail, do check out those blog posts. Okay, and then I'll briefly cover here automated rules. So, uh, so we're done with bid management, uh, the, the simplest automation. So let's talk about the next simplest one. Uh, automated rules from AdWords. So here you could look inside your uh, your Google Ads interface on the settings dropdown. There's an option to create an automated rule. So you go ahead and select that. 
And then Google gives you a couple of basic options, right? So if you wanted to uh, pause keywords that had a low cost per or a high cost per acquisition, uh, that would be very easy to do. But you can see the options that you have on here are relatively limited. You can only run these once a day. Your look back window is a single look back window. You can do much more sophisticated stuff. If you use a script or you use a tool like Optimizer, uh, you can actually take uh, one of my favorite scripts from Google, which is the declining ad group performance one. Um, and what that one does is it says, let's look four weeks ago. And if the CTR from four weeks ago to three weeks ago was lower, and then again, from three weeks to two weeks, it dropped even more. And two to one week ago, it dropped even more. So it was consistently declining week over week. Um, maybe send me an alert, maybe pause that keyword. Well, you can't do that with an automated rule because the automated rule has a single look back window. You cannot compare date ranges, but using a script, using another tool, you can actually start looking at these multiple look back windows. You can do some really, really cool stuff, right? So those are the limitations on automated rules. And that's why I think it's so important to talk about ad scripts because these can go past those limitations. Now, Ad scripts. I don't know how many people here on the call have used ad scripts. I'm sure you've heard about them, but they are very simply pieces of JavaScript code that can automate tasks in Google Ads on a predefined schedule. So it's like you can put a piece of code inside of your Google Ads interface and then fully automate whatever that code is going to do. Now, here's the code. This is usually when people head for the doors when I start talking about code, but please don't. Uh, because if you can hit control C and control V, you can do ad scripts. All you have to be able to do is copy some code that somebody else has written and paste it into your account and then make a few tweaks to it. Right? So th the other kind of point to illustrate this is that if I show you the picture of this, um, think for a moment, do you, do you know what this thing is and how to operate it? Uh, seems pretty complicated, right? Like if somebody gave that to me, I'd be a little bit confused and I wouldn't know exactly what to do. Now, if I put the shell on that thing, it's actually just a remote control for a television. So there's a lot of stuff happening under the buttons, but all I care about as an advertiser and someone who wants to do ad scripts is the fact that I just need to push these buttons to, to make the TV do different things. Like all the hard stuff is basically hidden behind those buttons. It's the same thing in ad scripts. So you have your configuration versus your logic. So you get this script. A script could be a thousand lines long, very intimidating. But if you look, generally, each script starts with a couple of lines at the top, which are your configuration, your settings. So in the case of this script, there's literally two things that me as an advertiser, I have to fill out for it to do what I want it to do. Now, all of the remaining lines of code, I don't have to worry about. This is the logic. This is what takes my settings and actually does something useful with those settings. One of the reasons I do like scripts is that if you have the capability to, uh, to do a little bit of programming yourself, or you want to hire someone to do the programming, well, the code is right there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can actually take the code that I've written, and you can tweak it to do exactly what you want. But at the most basic level, if you don't want to get into the code, all you have to know is how to do the configuration. So here's the budget script that I promised. Um, so you all know that Google, about a year ago, decided that over-delivery would be changed. So over-delivery was the fact that Google asks for a daily campaign level budget. But even though you give it a daily budget, they can spend more than your daily budget. It used to be they could spend an additional 20% above your daily budget. Now, Google changed that rule from one day to the next, and they said, we're actually going to spend up to 100% more than your daily budget. And that's kind of scary. If you've been managing accounts a certain way to know that from one day to the next, Google can spend twice as much money as you told it it should be spending, OK, well, that could create some problems, right? Now, in 30 lines of code, I wrote a script that brings it back to how it used to be, 20% over delivery. And not just that, I can now actually put in any number, any percentage of over delivery between 0 um, and 100%, which is Google's upper limit. So if I never wanted to spend more than my actual daily budget, I would just put in my uh, allowed over delivery percentage is 0. This script runs every single hour. It pulls whatever the campaign's daily budget is. It compares the daily spend for that campaign. And if it's more than the allowed amount, it pauses that campaign. 30 lines of code. I'm fully automating this every single hour. This is running in my account. It's looking at all my campaigns, and it's making sure I spend exactly what I want to spend. 
if you wanted to take this sort of a script, you could copy and paste the same one into Bing ads. In Bing ads, they automatically translate the code to be compatible with the Bing system. So, uh, so it may not be able to do labels, for example, but it would still be able to handle the budget limitation and pausing any campaigns that spend too much money. So <clears throat> that's uh, a good example of some, some useful code right there. Now, uh, there is one recent change that Google made to make it even a little bit simpler to separate the code from the settings. So now you can have multiple files that work together. So I've split it out here between code and settings. So you, as the marketer, you only have to look at that one line. This, this is the file that you change, fred at optimizer.com. That's what you change. Whatever's on the code tab that you see right there, leave it alone. Unless you know what you're doing, don't go there because that's the stuff that actually does the work. Now, uh, for the more advanced advertisers on the call today or the agencies running scripts potentially on multiple accounts, uh, managing the settings does become a little bit complex. And there are tricks and workarounds that you can do to put all the logic and all the set, sorry, to put all the um, settings. And, and I put the wrong header there on that uh, sl slide here, but it should say store complex settings in sheets. So you can take a Google sheet, you put in the account ID, and then you put the settings for that specific script. So rather than having to maintain 10 different versions of the same basic script, you have the script read in the spreadsheet, and then the spreadsheet says, okay, for the, the tire account, we need to check hourly uh, during the five o'clock hour. Uh, and for the blog account, maybe we're doing a monthly check and we're running in hours one and 15. So it really helps you separate the logic from the settings. Now there's a current problem in Google ads. So they've changed how match types work. I'm sure you've all heard about this has been kind of a, a big deal in the industry, but in 2018, close variants uh, got changed again. So over time, the meaning of quote unquote exact match keywords has changed. In 2018, in uh, September, Google said that if a query has relatively the same meaning as your exact match keyword, Google can show an ad for it. Um, and that's kind of problematic because we're used to having exact match be exact match, but exact match is no longer actually exact match. So I wrote a script and you can copy the script from the link that you see right there. But uh, it basically says, well, column E, that's the keyword I had. And column F, that's the search term for which my ad actually showed up when my keyword was an exact match. And you can tell these are a lot of typos, um, additional letters being put in. Um, but in, in nowadays, they could actually change the actual meaning of some of the words. So if you want to understand how does close variant matching impact your account, this script will generate a spreadsheet that you can use to understand exactly how. So we ran this script on another account and we saw that for the keyword blank kids pajamas, Google took pajamas and said PJs is basically the same word. It's a synonym. Um, and that makes sense, right? So this is helpful to us because we didn't have to think about every single synonym. Uh, one of my favorite examples, by the way, is there's like 500 different ways that you can misspell Britney Spears. So if you were selling Britney Spears music, well, good luck putting in every single typo that people could have of her name plus the word music. Uh, Google simplifies that through, um, through these close variants matching. Now, uh, if you look at the last one, camo sweatshirt, camouflage sweat space shirt, you know, that might be more into the similar intent. So again, that's still a good one, but you can start to understand exactly what Google considers to be similar intent. And now based on this, you could use a script to automate this. You could say, if the query that Google's showing my ad for is actually worse than the performance of the keyword, I wanna automatically make that a negative keyword. So I wanna take back control over my exact match. Or if the query is too different from the keyword, I don't want to risk it. Like I want to keep my exact match, exact match. So thanks to a script, you can actually take the code that I've written and you can tweak it. You can start putting in these sorts of parameters. Um, so how would you look at, for example, how similar a query is to a keyword? Well, there's this whole notion of the Levenstein distance. It's a, it's a formula that's out there. It's a, an algorithm basically. And it gives you a numerical score of how close a query is to a keyword. So let me show you an example. So if you go from the keyword pajamas, um, <clears throat> right? So we start from the keyword pajamas. Uh, we took out the A, so that added one point. So every character that we change adds one point. Then we took out uh, another A, so added one more point, took out the M, took out the A. So we added all up. So now we have a score of four. 
So this is a Levenstein distance of four to go from pajamas to PJs. Now, what I can do is I can say any Levenstein distance that's greater than three, I don't trust or I need to review it, right? So it highlights those close match variants to you so that you can review it, make sure they're good, or you could say fully automated and simply add these as negatives because again, I don't trust it and I, I don't want to risk it. Now, there's another problem that we've seen in the industry uh, over the past couple of years, but there's sort of brand identity uh, protection. So if you're advertising on YouTube, there's a lot of sketchy YouTube videos out there. And if you put your ads next to a YouTube video with bad content, that could actually impact your brand. It could have your potential customers perceive you as uh, uh, not being very self-aware, I guess. So one way to automate this is you can look at the thumbs up and the thumbs down of videos on YouTube. Um, the script can be copied from that link right there, but the script basically says if you have too high a ratio of thumbs down votes versus thumbs up votes, then automatically go and add a negative placement for that video. So you're proactively making sure your ads are not showing next to videos that are in some way contentious uh, or potentially offensive. So you don't fully leave it up to Google, but you actually proactively take some charge of that. Now, how do you get started with these scripts, right? So you can copy and paste some of the scripts that I've given. There's sites like free AdWords scripts. There's uh, Optimizer. There's all kinds of places where you can go to pick up some code. Now in the new ads interface, you simply go to the hamburger menu at the top, bulk actions, you go to scripts, copy and paste the script in. And then from there, you can preview it and you can start to automate it for your account. And the same thing as of last month, you can now do for Bing ads. So you can take a Google ad script, you can copy and paste it into Bing. They will automatically transform it to be compatible with the Bing system. Um, they are more limited, so there might be a few things that don't work, but they've tried to make it as easy as possible. Um, and, and I love this because Bing, because it's usually a smaller percentage of spend, tends to not get as much attention. Now we can actually start to automate some of these things and, and even do a better job on Bing ads thanks to automation. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I would love to take some questions and see if I can answer anything on automation. Uh, in the follow-up email, we'll also be sending you a link to uh, a new auditing tool that we have at Optimizer. So uh, you'll be able to score your AdWords account or your Google Ads account against everyone else we have in the system. And you'll find out if you're in the top 10%, the bottom 10%, and we'll even give you some ideas on how to make your accounts better. Uh, and I also welcome questions at my email right there. Andrea, um, I'll take any questions that came in. Fantastic, thank you so much, Fred. Uh, the first question is, uh, we tried bid optimize for conversions automation in AdWords and it bombed. What has been your experience with that versus using scripts? Yeah, I mean, so for some people it works really well, for some people it bombs, and I, I guess it depends on how much data you have and how consistent that data is. Uh, ultimately, it depends on a machine learning system. So Google is trying to make predictions. So if there's a lot of fluctuation that's sort of uh, not part of the factors that Google looks at, uh, then they could really be missing the boat on that one. And that's where something like scripts really gives you control. But, 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 but at the highest level, I suppose the... Uh, bid automations from Google, they are a black box. They use machine learning. So it's kind of like you trust the system to do whatever it does. And that's all you can do. If one day it stops working, there's very little recourse as far as you making it do a better job. Uh, now, scripts, on the other hand, here you get to program your logic as to how the bid should be managed. Uh, but it tends to be much more rule-based. So it would say, if my cost per acquisition is too high, lower my bid. Uh, there's not quite as much machine learning and, and picking up on different signals that goes into that, um, or it would take you a lot more time to build that out, but it does give you control and it does give you visibility. And if something's not working, you can actually understand exactly why the wrong decision was made and you can fix it, right? So one is uh, scripts is more control. Um, the Google automated bidding is more hands off, uh, looks at different things. And so if it doesn't work, certainly scripts are a good option. Under CPA automated bids, how do keyword match types work there? Uh, should I make an ad group with only one match type? Or how does it work if I have the same keyword in phrase and an exact match? Yeah, and so that answer becomes more and more complicated as Google does more of these closed variants and it takes away that control. 
Uh, the way to think about keyword match types, honestly, is how limited you want Google to be in terms of the different queries that they show you for. Um, so let me give you this example. If you had a broad match keyword, which is the, the most flexible one from Google's perspective, and you had a target CPA rule, Google would actually look at each individual query, each individual variation of that broad match keyword, and give it the right bid at the time that the search was done. Right, so the the number that you see against that keyword is the average of everything, but Google actually does set different bids based on what the query is, and you can segment out that data. So in the Google Ads interface, you can turn on the segmentation by match type for the broad match, and they will say when that broad match was exactly the same as the search, these were the numbers that came out of it. And so at that point, you can start to maybe see that Google is not doing a great job for one specific match type that's when you could break that out, maybe give it a different, uh, maybe take it out of automated bidding, give it a different target, um, or just exclude it altogether. Are SMART goals a good micro conversion? <clears throat> are SMART goals, um, yeah, so the SMART goals, those are the automated ones. And yeah, I suppose that's a good one that you could use to, uh, to give Google more information. Do you have any advice regarding setting a target CPA for search versus display versus video campaigns? Well, I mean, honestly, Google expects you to set the same target CPA because that's your goal, right? So um, do you value a lead coming from the display network differently than one coming from the search network? So generally, the answer would be no. However, if you see that you get more junk leads from the display network, then the answer becomes yes. Then you should have a lower cost per acquisition for that. Um, but this is the whole tricky part about like what we tell Google versus what we actually count in our business is often different, right? So somebody fills out a lead gen form, then you call up that person and you find out, oh, that was a junk lead. Google misses that last portion of the data. Now you can actually feed that back into Google uh, by taking your CRM data and, and giving that back. So if you give Google the actual thing that you look at and that you value, then the CPAs would be the same. The target CPA would be the same. But if there's some sort of a disconnect and in that portion that Google is not looking at, you see differences, that's when you would set different target CPAs. What happens if you are using smart bidding but do not have enough conversions? Do you recommend switching to manual CPC if you do not want to track a micro conversion? And does the platform default to a di different bidding strategy because you don't have enough conversions? Yeah, so in the beginning, you wouldn't even be able to turn on smart bidding. Um, and then if you drop out of it, then they will revert back to the CPCs that were there. The uh, you know, whether you use the micro conversions then or go to automated bidding, it depends a little bit. So if you can correlate that your newsletter signups <clears throat> tend to convert to an actual customer roughly 10% of the time, and that data seems to be persistent or um, uh, pretty steady month over month, then yeah, it'd probably be pretty good to use a micro conversion. And since it was a 10% conversion from the, the newsletter to the actual lead, you would set your CPA target at 10% of what you actually wanted to achieve. Um, and that way you still get the advantage of the machine learning components that Google has. Um, you know, on the flip side, if you have some, uh, so, so, so I've seen some customers do some really interesting things where they across accounts or across campaigns understand which things are similar. Um, so for example, say you were selling electronics you could label different keywords and you could say, well, this one is a television um, or this one is like consumer electronics versus this one is uh, scientific electronics. And so based on those um, labels that people have put on, they can do aggregations. And, and even though the data lives in dispersed campaigns or even accounts, they do a roll up and they say, well, generally for scientific instrument electronics, we see a 7% conversion rate. And for these other ones, we see a 10% conversion rate. Um, and, and if that's kind of like the data tweaking and manipulation that you're doing, that's really hard to give back to Google. So then it becomes much more interesting to use something like a script to actually pick up on, on how you've massaged the data and take action based on that. Automated rules no longer seems to support session duration from analytics. Is this correct? 
Um, I don't know. I would have to follow up on that one. I'm happy to take a look at it. Um, one of my friends is actually the product manager who did bring the analytics data into ads, uh, Google ads. Um, so I can talk to him and find that out for you. Okay. And does Google, uh, does Google automated bidding account for different click attribution, last click, first click? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, and this is very important. So when you take a smart bidding automation from Google, go to your conversion settings page in Google ads and make sure you've uh, really looked at how you set it up. So even if you have like micro conversions, um, that would become part of quote unquote, all conversions to Google. You can specify selectively which ones of those you bring into the quote unquote conversions metric. The conversions metric, that is what Google uses to do its bid management. And then secondarily to that, you set your attribution model. Um, and so to kind of expand on that a little bit, historically in PPC, people have looked at last click attribution models. So the last interaction that happened before the conversion, that's the one that gets all the credit. Obviously that's incorrect. Uh, that leaves your upper funnel traffic with uh, presumably no value, but it was that upper funnel traffic that even exposed people to the fact that your company provides this service or sells this good. So you want to assign some value to that. So do play with the attribution models and try to figure out what most mimics what happens to you in the real world. Attribution models, by the way, uh, so people ask what's the right one to use. It's really, really tricky. A model is simply supposed to be a mathematical representation of the real world. So what your job is, is to figure out which one mimics what we actually see happen. Um, right. So we've seen clients run similar campaigns in similar markets. Uh, so for example, the Portland market versus the Seattle market, they use different attribution models and they see uh, after we've run one attribution model in one market, different one in a different one, um, does the growth or the success that we see in Google ads actually correlate to the success that we see uh, kind of in the offline way that we measure the business. Um, and then the one that most closely follows or tracks, that's the attribution model you want to be using. Do you have a script to automate the price extensions for Google search campaign from Google Sheets or a feed? Uh, we don't have that, but uh, I'm always open to writing new scripts. So why don't you send me an email uh, and with the details on what you want? And I'm sure we can do that for you. Okay. Um, we recently just configured our conversion, so we don't have a lot of conversion data. How do we configure our bid strategy until we get more data? Yeah, so in that case, you're kind of stuck with manual CPC. Um, and yeah, I mean, honestly, not a whole lot more to say on that other than manual CPC until you have enough data. Um, if you do find that you want to consider sticking with manual, but kind of controlling it yourself, uh, then it is interesting to have like a very strong naming convention of your ad groups and campaigns so that you can kind of correlate what things are similar um, through Excel. Um, and that will give you much more information. So, so basically we call this like attribute bidding and maybe shopping is the easiest way to explain this. But, but what we can say is if you're selling a red long sleeve t-shirt, but we don't have enough data for how many sales we get on the red long sleeve t-shirt, we can look at a few things. We can say, well, what happens for other red pieces of clothing or what happens for other long sleeve t-shirts? The way that you can do those roll-ups outside of shopping ads is generally by having good, strong naming conventions or labels that you attach to things so that you can say, well, okay, rather than looking at individual keywords, tell me my aggregate stats for all long sleeve t-shirts across my whole account and let me use that conversion data to set a better bid for that individual t-shirt where maybe I only got 17 impressions last month. But because I had lots of impressions for long sleeve shirts across the whole account, I actually do know what it's likely to uh, do in terms of performance. Is there any tool or method out there that will help take into account lead quality? Yeah, and I think some of the sponsors of uh, this series do this sort of call tracking, uh, lead scoring. There's different methodologies around it. So if it comes to phone calls, some of them will listen for keywords uh, that indicate a potential sale. Others will look at how much was the 
uh, customer talking versus the sales rep talking, and then they make patterns based on that and say generally uh, this sort of uh, a ratio indicates a good call versus a bad call. So there's a number of automated options out there that uh, that will take care of that, and all of those can also feed back into Google Ads, and then that leads into my point that the better information you give to Google, the better they can do uh, the bid automation and actually bid for what matters to you. Do you think SCAGs and alpha beta are still recommendable strategies? Yeah, um, I'm a big fan of SCAGs and alpha beta. And uh, so for the people who don't know what those are, uh, the alpha beta basically says the beta campaigns are broad match keywords where we want to fish or mine for good queries. Once we find a good query that drives conversions, we take it as an exact match and we put it into an alpha campaign. The whole notion is that on the alpha campaign, because we know these are converting search terms and keywords, we can allocate more budget to it. The beta campaign, which is more experimental, can have a more conservative budget. Um, so, so that's kind of one angle on the whole thing. The other reason that I really like having at least some alpha campaigns in my account is that it really gives me better insight into what's happening in the market. Uh, one of the biggest difficulties in AdWords is that your numbers are always shifting, but in many cases, you have no idea why that's happening. Is it the bits that you changed? Is it the ad text that you changed? And you can't tell because with these broad match keywords, well, from one day to the next, Google might have drastically shift, shifted for which queries your ad was shown. Um, and that might actually be the bigger factor than the bid change that you made. But you don't know that it's really hard to know. And, and by having an alpha campaign where you're more restrictive about what Google is allowed to show your ads for, which keywords, you can at least rule out the whole uh, query mix changing. And then you could say, OK, well, it looks like this campaign is now performing better thanks to the ads that we changed. So let's go and make that change in the beta campaign as well. Does it ever make sense? to use manual bid adjustments within a campaign using a fully automated bidding scheme. For instance, wouldn't I be double dipping if I added a 10% bid increase for better performing mobile, given that Google takes that into account within the bidding strategy? Yeah, that's a very good point. So uh, that kind of goes to the core point that the better you understand what these automations do, uh, the more successful you will be and the less you will waste your time doing what was just suggested, right? So the, the person who asked the question obviously understands that that does no good because Google uh, doesn't consider that bid adjustment if you're already using automated bidding. Now, it's kind of weird because they will let you set the bid adjustment, but it doesn't actually do anything. So a lot of people just go and spend time on that, not realizing it's a duplicated effort. Um, the one time that Google does look at some of these bid adjustments, though, is with the minus 100%. So if you're basically saying, I want to exclude a certain uh, group of customers or devices or that type of thing. Um, Google is telling us to stop testing ads and just keep adding new ones because the good ones will get picked. And if a bad one was picked, that's because we would otherwise not have won the auction. Do we believe that? <clears throat> Um, yes, so <laughs> ad text automation is another <clears throat> fascinating thing here. So th they now have responsive text ads. We basically put in like uh, four headlines and 15 description lines, and then Google automatically puts those together based on what they think will work best for that specific user. Um, the more you let Google do these things, the more potential traffic you will get. So I, maybe this is best illustrated through kind of a similar example. So um, there's an ad rotation setting in Google Ads. If you set it to even rotation, uh, most advertisers would think, well, if I have two ads and I told Google to rotate evenly between them, then both of them should get uh, 500 impressions if, if there were 1,000 total. That's not actually the case because what Google does, first of all, it's a coin flip. So the even rotation, um, maybe slightly off, so the one ad may be shown three times and the next ad gets shown two times, but over time, they will even out to 50-50. Uh, now, the 50% of the time when ad number one is chosen, Google may say, well, this one came into the auction, but it is, in fact, not a good enough quality score or it's not relevant enough or it's just like a lousy ad. And then it ranks too low, and so it doesn't actually get the impression. So what Google means when they say 
um, rotate evenly is an even chance to enter the auction. It doesn't guarantee you actually get the impression in the auction. And that's the whole black box of quality score, which is sometimes really difficult to, to figure out. And, and so um, when Google says these things can happen, it, it, it is actually true. All right, I'm going to ask one more question. As Google uses its AI to determine if the user is more relevant than the other one to get more conversions, will Google give more weightage to its AI prediction than manual bidding? Yeah, exactly. So the AI that's making the prediction on which user is more likely to convert, that comes through the smart bidding options. So if you're using smart bidding, you are taking advantage of those capabilities. If you don't want to take advantage of that, you'd be on manual bidding. So you'd be on just straight up CPC bidding. If you kind of want a hybrid of the two, then I recommend enhanced CPC bidding. Um, and, and then I think the other point that I made, and, and I'll maybe say one more time, but even if you have a target CPA bidding or target ROAS bidding, Google will try to figure out which users individually are better. Uh, but one thing the system does not do well is it does not quickly learn that there's some unusual event happening. So if you're having a, like this time of year is perfect. Like if you're having a flash sale like Cyber Monday and all of a sudden your click through, your conversion rates double, it's going to take Google three days to pick up on the fact that that happened. And by the time they realize it, Cyber Monday is done and you've missed that whole opportunity, right? So um, kind of at that higher level, you as advertisers still want to tweak the targets up and down at a high level, uh, but then maybe let Google figure out on an individual user basis which one is more likely to convert than the other. Great. Um, if anybody has any more questions, please feel free to email Fred at his email address on screen. It's 1 o'clock, and I want to let everybody go and get back to the things they need to do. Thank you all so much for joining today's webinar, and thanks to Fred for tons of great information. As a reminder, we will send out the replay video and PDF of the slide, so please look out for that in your email and check your spam folders. Sometimes it goes there. And we hope to see you next time for another Master Your, Master Your Marketing presentation. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.